Today we're at the James Ford Bell Museum of Natural History in St. Paul, Minnesota, and the Bell Museum of Natural History is having an Audubon exhibit with animations of James Audubon's different paintings. We will explore those paintings as well as several other artists who are included in the exhibition. As I wander around the Audubon exhibit, I will be reading from the different plaques that describe the Audubon prints, as well as other artists who have contributed to the Bell Museum's art collection. Audubon Animated Audubon The name signifies detailed observation, innovative artistry, and a concern for habitat and conservation. In the early 1800s, John James Audubon set out to document the bird species of North America. He spent decades traveling to observe, collect, and draw birds. His life-size, vibrant paintings captured birds as they lived and changed how we understand nature. Audubon's images are detailed and accurate. They are also infused with energy, movement, and emotion. Enter Audubon's world through his masterpiece, The Birds of America. See and hear bird species, including some that are extinct or threatened, as they fly, hunt, and preen in virtual swamp and forest environments full of bird song. Study prints from the Bell Museum's rare elephant folio, newly conserved and brought back to life. Audubon's Innovation James Audubon was born in Haiti, raised in France, and an immigrant to the early U.S. Audubon traveled across North America studying birds. He sought to document and paint all of the bird species of the continent. His goal was to depict birds as he saw them, busy and full of life. Other artists drew birds in stiff, static profile. Experimenting with new methods, Audubon sketched his birds quickly as he watched them. He learned to observe and remember the postures and habits of each species without binoculars or camera for help. Combining his knowledge of bird behavior with careful examination of specimens, Audubon composed dramatic, compelling paintings. His birds fly, dive, and feed in vivid animation. His art was a revolutionary breakthrough. These prints come from the Bell Museum's folio of the Birds of America, one of no more than 120 complete sets in existence. James Audubon painted the Carolina parakeet, which was the only parrot species on the eastern seaboard of the United States, and it went extinct in the wild in 1910 and in captivity in 1918. This is Audubon's Pileated Woodpecker from Plate 111. Many people consider this one of Audubon's best compositions. Adult woodpeckers watch from above, while the young spar on a branch below. Audubon often had help producing the backgrounds of his paintings, but he painted both the birds and the plant a grapevine here. Audubon noticed that the bills of the young are longer than those of adults. Bills harden and wear down with use as birds excavate massive holes in trees to extract insect larvae for food. This is an example of a northern mockingbird painted by James Audubon from his Plate 21. Mockingbirds are known as mimics. They mimic a lot of other birds as well as they are constantly singing. If you hear them outside your window, that's probably a mockingbird if you live in the southern United States or the eastern United States.
this Arctic Turn from plate 250 of Audubon's The Birds of America can fly from its breeding grounds in the Arctic all the way down to the Antarctic. This hand-colored engraving from plate 157 of Birds of America is of rusty blackbirds. While floating down the Mississippi River on a flatboat in 1820, Audubon painted a rusty blackbird. Blackbirds breed in wet boreal forests across Canada and Alaska, once common winter residents in eastern United States. Blackbirds' numbers have declined nearly 90% since the 1960s, perhaps the sharpest decline of any North American land bird. The cause for this is unclear, but mercury contamination and the draining of wetlands and cutting of forests for farmland, especially in the southeastern United States, are contributing factors. This barred owl comes from plate 46. Audubon's barred owl painting does not include the gray squirrel shown in the print, which was added by the engraver from a separate drawing. Squirrels are active during the day, while owls are active at night. Owls are adapted to seeing well in very low light, but their vision during the day is very poor. Audubon wrote, that he often saw owls surprised by squirrels that approached them accidentally during the day, though at twilight owls hunt squirrels easily. Their other prey include mice, rabbits, small birds, frogs, and snake. The ivory-billed woodpecker from plate 66 is a hand-colored engraving. Audubon described the habitat of the ivory-billed woodpecker as gloomy and horrible swamps. These swamps held massive cypress and other trees. Harvesting these trees for their valuable lumber led to this bird's demise. The last confirmed sighting of this bird was in 1944. With protection, some southern swamps have regrown, and scattered reports of sightings and calls offer tantalizing hope that a few of these magnificent birds may still survive. Plate 77 from the hand-colored engravings of Birds of America is the Belted Kingfisher. Belted Kingfishers are common along streams and shorelines across North America. Their large heads and heavy bills are adaptations for diving headfirst into water to capture fish and other aquatic prey. Their most common call is a loud rattle. This is a species in which the female is more brightly colored than the male. In addition to a blue band near the neck shared with males, females have a chestnut-colored band at their waist, the belt for which the species is named. Birds of America by James Audemon, the wood stork, plate 216. Wood storks are social birds that hunt and nest in groups. They feed by moving their open bills back and forth through muddy water, feeling for fish or other prey. Audubon watched them wade through shallow lakes in a line, stirring up mud with their feet and striking the fish and frogs that rose to the water's surface. In the U.S., wood storks are found in only a few locations on the southeastern coast. Audubon observed them in Louisiana, where they no longer occur. From plate 307, little blue herons produce young that are all white. The chicks gradually add blue feathers after their first winter. 
as you can see in the bird on the left. Audubon discovered that some young remain white into their first breeding season, which means white, mottled, and blue birds can be found nesting together. They nest in the lower Mississippi Valley, where wetland habitat loss is a concern. One of Audubon's assistants, George Lehman, painted the landscape for this plate. This is an example of a whooping crane. This is plate 226 from Birds of America. In Audubon's time, whooping cranes were common, found wherever there were suitable wetland habitat. Audubon described the crane's regal movement throughout the tall grasses. With long and measured steps, he moves along, his head erect, his eye glistening with the light. Hunting and habitat loss devastated the population, and by 1950, only about 20 whoopers remained in the wild. Habitat protection and breeding programs have raised their numbers, but they remain an endangered species. From James Audubon's Birds of America, Plate 71, comes the red-shouldered hawk. It's a bird of wet forest. Red-shouldered hawks hunt small mammals, snakes, and frogs. Easily confused with the larger and more common red-tailed hawk, adults have reddish bands across their chests. The streaks on the breast here indicate that these are immature birds, which are seen primarily during the winter. Audubon took them for a separate species, dubbing them winter hawks. The red-shouldered hawk is a species of special concern in Minnesota due to its dependence on large tracts of forest. James Audubon's Birds of America, Plate 39, reveals a tufted titmouse. A male titmouse above and the female below busily extracts seeds from white pine cones. These small birds have soft gray feathers and erect crests. They are related to chickadees and, like them, can hang upside down to hunt for insects and seeds. Titmice flit through the forest in eastern and southeastern U.S. In recent decades, their range has expanded northward as far as southern Wisconsin, probably thanks to food from bird feeders. From James Audubon's Birds of America, Plate 354 comes Western Tanager and the Scarlet Tanager. Here, Audubon shows two of the most colorful bird species in North America. Male Western Tanagers sit above, while a male Scarlet Tanager displays his red back to females below. Both species live in the tree canopy and are more often identified by their songs than by their sight. Their call is a repetitive warble, described as sounding like a horse robin. When asked for their vote, Minnesota school children recommended the scarlet tanager for the state bird. To round out the Audubon exhibit, there are a number of other naturalist painters who focus primarily on birds, and the first one would be John Rutvin. And John Rutvin focuses in this painting on common eiders. It's a watercolor and acrylic that was finished in 1988. And in the Audubon tradition, with its emphasis on studying birds and nature, and making drawings that show every detail has guided John Rutvin's art. In this painting, he shows how the striking black and white plumage of the eider acts as effective camouflage in its environment of rocks, dark water, and patchy snow and ice. The common eider's population is stable and large, totaling several million. Local concentrations suffer when oil spills and other forms of pollution occur. Another of the Bell's 
preferred artist would be Tom Taylor, whose passion for puffins, uh, which is a gouache on board, completed in 1988, Tom Taylor expresses the beauty of wildlife in simplified shapes and repeated patterns. Here he focuses on common puffins, the only puffin species native to the Atlantic. In spring, they gather in colonies on coastal islands to breed in burrows. Their brightly colored bills are important in courtship and pair bonding. Human over-reliance on the puffin's meat, eggs, and feathers drove it out of North America. Reintroduction efforts in Maine have been successful. The puffins are vulnerable to warming oceans. Also in the collection of bird art for the bell would be Tom Taylor's Hawaiian Goose, also known as a nene, and it is a gouache on board from 1986. The nene, the state bird of Hawaii, is the last surviving goose species native to the islands. It is endangered, impacted by habitat loss, vehicle collisions, and also introduced predators such as cats and mongoose, which prey upon it. Its population was just 30 in 1960, but has recently expanded to nearly 3,000. Tom Taylor focuses on pattern, form, and color in representing wildlife and other subjects. He has often reproduced his paintings as prints or posters to benefit conservation organizations. Another artist representing birds would be Larry Toshik, who completed Snow Flurry Buffleheads in 1983. After a career as a commercial artist, Larry Toshik devoted himself to what he loved, wildlife and nature. This painting was inspired by the speed and movement of buffleheads flying in a tightly bunched flocks and by their ability to thrive in cold and stormy waters. Buffleheads are one of North America's smallest ducks. They nest in tree cavities, such as those made by woodpeckers. Their population is stable, but they depend on trees. Changing northern forests may affect their survival. And rounding out the Bell Museum's Audubon exhibit would be Donald Thomas, the Bell Museum's resident artist. This is a presentation of a bird's eye view of climate change. And in this artwork, a bald eagle and two rivers represent nature. They move through many places, flying in the sky above or running through lands below. They see many things and notice change over time. The eagle follows the rivers. Rivers give life to everything around them. They also reflect our appearance, the health of our ecosystems they support, and the ways our actions impact nature. Eagles and rivers depend on connections to each other and to other species and habitats. As they travel, they see and interact with animals and planets, habitats and places affected by climate change. What does the eagle see? What does the river know? Imagine you are one of them. What do you want to say about climate change? Thank you so much for joining Field Trip Nation today as we toured the Bell Museum Natural Histories Audubon exhibit. If you'd like more information about the exhibit or the Bell Museum, check out the links below. Thank you so much and have a sweet day.